talk about shutdown, which is working progress really. Um, it's a, a cruise funded pilot project, but we're still in the middle of running it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the process behind it and sort of the research tool that we're developing. Um, as we are bringing ideas from theater and psychology and neuroscience together in a co-created context and see what that gives us in terms of understanding decision making. And so the premise to start with is what would happen if we had a nationwide power failure happening right now? Well, first of all, all the lights would go out, but lots of other things would happen as well. And if it happened overnight and you would get up at six in the morning, it would be as cold in your house as it is now in this room because the heating didn't come on. And if you managed to stumble out of bed in the dark and you found that the lights are not working and actually nothing is working anymore, and then you remember that you have a battery powered uh, radio somewhere in the back of your cupboard and you still have batteries in it that work, you might be hearing something like this. This is a national emergency broadcast. It is Friday, 6 a.m. The national power failure that began late last night continues this morning. An initial statement from COBRA suggests that the outage is <coughs> thought to have been caused by heavy storms yesterday. It is not thought that a threat to national security was involved. The international terror threat has not been raised to critical and remains at severe. At present, COBRA cannot confirm when power will be restored. There will be widespread disruption to road travel due to failure of traffic signalling. Public transport networks are affected. Trains are not running and the airports are closed. Some bus services are running. COBRA advises strongly against non-essential travel. Mobile telephone networks are down. Landline services are seriously affected. In those areas where fiber optic cable has replaced copper wire, telephones will not work. The chief executive of Sainsbury's, Michaela King, has announced that all branches of the supermarket will not open today. It is anticipated that many other shops will remain closed today. COBRA will release further information later this morning and hourly emergency broadcasts will continue on BBC Radio channels 1 to 4. So, uh, this is one of the first bits of information that participants of our upcoming shutdown um, experiences will hear as a way to immerse them into the context of what happens when there is a nationwide blackout. And I'll, I'll give you a few of the things that were mentioned in there as well, but what will happen at different stages. So immediately your electricity will stop working, of course, and all your appliances, but also things like your central heating will not work. Because even if it may a gas-powered boiler, there is still electricity needed to operate the pump and to light the fuse when, when uh, your um, uh, gas comes on to heat the water. Uh, mobile phone networks will start stopping to work after 30 minutes to 2 hours. That's because the mobile phone masks do have battery uh, power backups, but those will only run a certain amount of time. And the more people use them, the faster they will run out. So they, whereas in theory, they're meant to last 2 hours during a blackout in Scotland, they were gone after 30 minutes because people just started calling. Uh, much more than before. Um, payment will stop working, traffic signaling, internet and data centers, all will be affected either immediately or um, as soon as some uh, power backup systems that they have stop working. Water will start running out after a few hours, especially if you live in an area where there is a water tower. If you live in an area where they have reservoirs and, and use gravity to feed your water, you'll be fine for, for quite a bit longer. But so after two hours, you could be out of water and your toilet would not flush anymore. Um, gas will start running out 24 to 72 hours in. But unless you have uh, a, a gas cooker that you can light without needing an electric sort of uh, fuse to that, you will not be able to use the gas anyway. Um, so why is this important? This a nationwide blackout is very high in the National Risk Register and risk being defined here as the probability times the impact and the probability of it is quite small but the impact of it happening would be massive 
And one of the reasons is that it will take seven days to restart the national grid if it goes offline completely. So we're in for seven days of a power blackout, should it happen. Um, the reasons why it could happen, it could be something like a big storm surge together with a few other things. It could be a cyber attack taking out the system as well. Um, and what is unknown, a big unknown, is how will the public respond and cope with that situation? And what does the government need to say? What do they need to communicate to make sure that everything works well? There's a lot of planning that has gone on behind the scenes to help us deal with that situation. The emergency services have sort of plans in place, the national grid has plans in place, but the big unknown here, the thing that puts us in box three of the crew's definition of uncertainty, radical uncertainty, is people's responses. We simply don't know how we as a nation will respond to that. And so um, Cruz had this as a pilot project uh, in the sort of four projects or five projects that it had listed uh, out of conversations with policymakers in the early months of um, the Cruz network. And so this call was public reaction to nationwide power failure was, was sort of the title of it. The policy end user here was the cabinet office who coordinates for all of the different departments that have a stake in this, transport, communications, and several other ones. And when the call was out there and applications came in for all the other bits, none came in for this one, right? And why is that? Why, why wasn't no one interested in saying like, oh, I've got some methods that can help us understand what would happen? Why is this such a difficult question that people with a background in psychology or decision making would shy away from it? Perhaps a lot of them hadn't heard about it, but one issue that I think would sort of keep people at bay and even kept me at bay for a long time <laughs> is the thing that we know as the intention behavior gap, which we already heard different sort of versions of today, which is that when you ask people how will they behave in a certain situation, that's not necessarily the same as how they will actually behave when you put them in that situation. And it's not that you can't trust people to be honest to you, it's just that we're very poor predictors of how we will behave in unusual situations that we have never experienced before. It's really hard for us to imagine those situations. And that can be surprising to ourselves when we find ourselves behaving very different to how we thought we would be behaving. And it can um, surprise and wrong food experts as well when they're trying to predict how people will behave. To give one example, uh, the first experiment that showed um, evidence of an intention behavior gap was conducted quite a while ago. And before that period, in the, before the 1930s, no one actually knew that there was an intention behavior gap. There wasn't, it wasn't known as a concept. The idea was sort of the common sense view was that if you ask people how they would behave, they would tell you how they would behave. And if they got it wrong, they were probably lying. Um, but the first experiment that looked at this was a really interesting experiment by a French psychologist who had moved to the US Lapierre. And um, he was traveling with a, a Chinese colleague of his, an American Chinese colleague. And before they set out on the travel, they were really concerned about whether they would be allowed into hotels and restaurants um, with this um, Chinese colleague, or whether they would be sort of re refused hospitality. But they come in the first establishment, and there's no problem. The, all, all of them are served and are treated, treated very well. And he used that experience and the concern he had about that experience as he, he turned it into a psychological experiment. And they started traveling across the US and visiting establishments, hotels, and restaurants, and whatever. They were never refused admittance and, and were always being served well and properly. And a couple of months later, he sent all of those establishments a letter asking them if they would serve or accept a Chinese person into their establishment. And everyone, or 92% or of the responses that came back said no. So this is quite 
an unusual behavior intention gap for our modern ears, right? Because now we would think of it going the opposite way, that people might not be willing to refuse you, but they actually might be treating you very badly. But this experiment was conducted in 1930s, in 34, and then the whole sort of um, acceptance of um, prejudices and preconceptions about people of different races was different. It was the opposite of how it was now. So it was very acceptable in society to be prejudicial against certain groups. But then in practice, people didn't... There were lots of other concerns that meant that they weren't always following up on those specific intentions that they had about not serving Chinese people in their uh, establishments. So, um, as I said, it can be surprising and wrong-footing sometimes. And um, so, because of the... Um, so, as, as I was sitting in a cruise meeting with David, where he mentioned there's no taker yet for this particular project, something happened, and, like two things came together in my head. A couple of years ago, I started working with Fan Chen, who are really a very interesting uh, organization. They call themselves an ex-theater these days. And they um, used to be a theater, but as uh, a couple of years ago, three, four years ago, they started to transition from making pieces with actors where people would watch to making participatory theater. Where, where there are no more actors, and it's you who comes through the door, who will take part in the experience, you're the participant and you're the actor in the play, basically. And they had reached out to me at some point, um, uh, I forgot to say I'm a neuroscientist, um, and, and that sort of colors all of my uh, thinking about how people behave and how people um, um, think and make decisions, etc. So at some point they had re reached out to me to help them understand how they could build psychology and neuroscience into their audience-centric performances. And so I started working together with them and we went on a week's retreat somewhere to a very nice place, Dartington Hall in, in, in Devon, and, uh, and we started coming up with ideas of how you could build a participatory theater piece, but build psychological tests and theories and ideas in there so that it would just it would be a little bit more than just like come and take part in this fun game. And I'm going to show you, so this picture is from one of the things that came out of that meeting called Disaster Party. It's really a lot of fun. I, unfortunately, I don't have time to explain it. But I'm going to talk about another one that we did, the Justice Syndicate. I'm going to show you a very uh, a brief excerpt from a clip that is a bit longer that talks about the Justice Syndicate as a theatrical experience. So this is not yet about the psychology, this is about the theatre experience, and then we'll talk about the psychology. Without people, this is the show. What we've made is a structure. A kind of structure to claim it. When there are people inside the structure, it becomes a show. It's a piece for a group. Lots of people talk about theatre as a shared experience. We're interested in how people have different experiences of what they share. In this show, The Justice Center, Everyone is a juror. They review evidence on tablets and try and reach a majority decision. We're asking them to draw conclusions about whether the accused is guilty or not guilty based on the information they receive. The show plays out differently depending on how they fill in the gaps. So, try not to infer. When people, other people infer, oh, she must have felt like this and he must have been like that. It's not like you don't know and you can only use what you're given to make a point. And so it's quite, and then when that comes to flash, where you're like, oh, you're just, you're just assuming you're not actually, there's not physical evidence to back your point up, and they disagree, it can get quite deep. And um, really understanding and listening to see how, like, people form opinions about people and how they judge people. So the interesting thing about 
this justice syndicate and how it came about is that um, David mentioned this morning in his talk these traditions of psychological research from the 1950s, which we somehow seem to have lost somewhere along the way when we started thinking about optimization and maximization of utility and all that. And, um, and, I, and I also have a weak spot for a lot of what those psychologists were doing because they had the guts to go out in the real world and do experiments in the real world. And there are reasons why experimental psychology and started doing things in a lab and not in the real world anymore. But I'm thinking that we, we've, lo we've lost something along the way. And perhaps with modern technology, we can create other conditions, new conditions, new experimental conditions, where we can recreate more realistic experiences and still have some kind of repeatable uh, experimental setup that we can do. And so what we were doing when we were designing this brainstorming together with Dan and Rachel, who are the theater makers, and with a couple of actors and myself, is we were trying to think of like, how can you create a, an experience for participants where then you can inject a theory of psychology into it. And the one that I was specifically interested in at that point was one of Festinger's theories about group communication and group consensus building which he wrote a paper about in 1960, a few years before he wrote uh, his theory of cognitive dissonance. And we came up with this jury format, which is something that people recognize, etc. But within that format, we built these ideas of psychology, of how individuals make decisions, how we might stick to a decision, start defending and justify it, how we uh, deal with the disagreement that arises in a group. And we, we came up with that format and we said, okay, we can do it like this. And then at the same time, we had conversations with a, with a young computational artist, a young chap who just graduated from Goldsmiths, who brought in the technological and digital angle. And so we built this uh, platform, digital platform, which allows you to present evidence to a group of people where they're all seeing the, the same evidence at the same time and then, and the further they go into that experience, the more time there is for them to talk about this and to disagree or agree with each other. And when we started doing the first test with it, everything that I expected from the psychology books, textbooks and papers came out in the, in the experience and even much stronger than I expected it to come out. So it was a really powerful experience for participants, and it really was a decision-making experience that they were going through. And so we then very quickly realized that we had something more than just a jury play. We had a tool for decision-making. And so it covers really all of these things that I've got here at the bottom. It, it allows us to do audience-centric theater. We can take this into art centers and play it there with people who pay money to come and attend it. But it's also a tool for exper experiential learning. And I'll show some examples of that later on. It's a tool to test psychological theories. And it also has co-creation at its heart. Because it already was the co-creation of the psychologist and the neuroscience angle, the storytelling angle of the theater makers, and then the digital angle of, of our computational artists. And then the platform actually calls out for other types of expertise to be dropped in there and to be transformed into a story that can allow us to test decision making under certain circumstances. So, um, that idea then, it, and it's because of the cruise meeting where David mentioned that there hadn't been any takers, the day before I'd been running a trial session of the Justice Syndicate and that's why I thought, like, oh, maybe there's some mileage in transforming this justice syndicate jury format into something that allows us to understand how people will respond to a nationwide power failure. And that became then the title of sort of the <coughs> application that we submitted. So, um, as um, has also been mentioned several times before today, you have to start with the end user questions when you want to make policy relevant research. And so we went, I went a couple of times to the cabinet office and had conversations with them 
I wish there was much more space for conversations. I think out of more um, sort of intimate co-creation, there would be much more coming. But at the very, so as a start and as a pilot project, this has been really useful to understand what are the things that they need answers to, that they don't have an answer to at the moment that they would like to hear. So here's a couple of them that we have built into the experience as we are developing it now. The first one is travel behavior. If the government tells you to stay at home unless it's super essential, how are people going to interpret that? How are they going to say, well, my thing is essential and venture out on the road rather than say, mm, I better listen to the government and stay at home. So what are the conditions that will make them take that one decision to go out into a slightly dangerous situation? The one is, the other one is critical workers. If the government communicates that everyone should stay at home unless you're a critical worker and you're advised to then go into uh, your work, who will identify as a critical worker? Well, obviously, police and fire brigades know that they're critical workers and there are systems for them to be communicated to come into work. But will nurses and doctors know it? Well, they probably will. But what about other people? In one of the prototypes that we just run last week, there was someone who said, like, well, maybe I'm a critical worker because my boss, he's not going to pay me if I don't come and he's not going to make any money, so maybe I'm a critical worker. And that's something that you would not expect if you were just to sort of think of, like, who's going to be in that category of critical workers. Well, it seems that people who don't earn a lot of money see themselves as critical workers. Uh, use of essential resources. So, if the government were to tell you, please do not fill your bathtub with water because it will run out much quicker for everyone else. But does that mean that everyone runs to the bathroom and opens their tap to make sure that they get the last uh, bit of water out? It probably does. Everyone I've spoken to admits this, including the people from the cabinet office who are <laughs> having this as their responsibility. Um, electricity in A&E, so the one um, resilient part of our society is probably our hospitals where they have a redundant backup for a situation like this and so hospitals will, will have power and will continue to work. What happened in Lancaster when there was a local blackout a couple of years ago is that 12 hours in a bunch of students walked into the door found the first power socket and plugged into their phones to charge them. So again, if the government asks you not to go to A&E unless it's a medical emergency, will people think like, oh yeah, there should be power there. Maybe I shall go there and get a hot meal in the canteen or I, I can use the, 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 the power sockets there. Um, and then things like community behavior, like is the community going to pull together and start to look after the vulnerable around them? Illegal behavior, like a lot of the conversations that I have about this, what will happen, is that people interpret this through the, the, the lens that they have of the riots of Tottenham and the film that they've seen about the power blackout in New York that led to massive looting, right? Now, if you look at the literature about this, and someone's done the literature review for the cabinet office, um, if you look at the literature for this, there is almost no evidence that crime will go up in a massive way. There is like, it's more people just plowing on with doing things as they have been doing them before, rather than um, becoming criminals altogether. But we're also living in a relatively unequal society, and we've not had big power cuts that go on for seven days in urban cities with a lot of inequality. So can we rely on these studies that happen in smaller towns, in more local areas? It's a difficult issue. And then resourcefulness, how, how are people going to know that they should turn on the radio, or that the radio will be the only means that they have? And how is that going to differ between someone who lives in the countryside and probably still has a battery-powered radio, and someone who lives in the city and doesn't have one anymore, a millennial? So, for instance, in one of the prototype, or in none of the prototype sessions that we've run so far, people thought like, oh, I could go into my car and listen on the car radio. And that's because all of the ones we've, all of the people we've run it with are living in cities and they don't have um, cars with car radios at their um, disposal. Safety of food, 
monoxide poisoning are really two big health concerns that can happen where people eat things that have, that have gone off or where they put a generator in their living room and then all poison themselves. Uh, that happens in, in, the, in the real world. So how is that going to play out in the UK? How will people in the UK do things as opposed to the reports that we have, for instance, of Canada or Italy and so on? And then how is the official communication going to affect all of those choices and behaviors that people make? Right? So our first attempt um, was like, okay, let's try to recreate some of the physical effects of a power failure. Let's put people in a room that's cold and where the lights are off and there are, there's no power coming out of the sockets. And then we thought, what's the next thing we need to do? Oh, um, phones are so important in our life, so we, we should jam phone signals so that their phones stop working. But it turns out that's illegal. So you can end up two years in jail if you do that. And uh, so there were, there were lots of um, aspects that made that really difficult to create the physical circumstances of the power failure. Um, and, and some of them you could solve with, with having more money to do this type of research. You could build a house uh, that's a Faraday cage where no uh, radiation can enter um, and, and where there is a loo that doesn't flush anymore. But to keep things nimble and mobile, it didn't work like that. And so dramatically, we couldn't get it to work. We had written pieces and dialogue and whatever. It didn't work dramatically. It didn't work psychologically. So we know about the, um, um, what's it called, the sunk cost effect. And we decided to cut our losses and not fall for the sunk cost fallacy here. And we tried a second thing, which is where we really like, I went back to principle, first principle, and I said, like, what are the two psychological principles that we could use to give people an experience of this without us being able to recreate the physical experience of it? And the first one is a sentence that I've sort of picked from Cialdini, the, the uh, social psychologist who wrote Influence and Persuasion. Uh, so his, his um, uh, neck of the woods is sort of persuasion and influence. And, and one of the principles he talks about is the importance of attention, he says, is importance. Once you draw attention to something, it becomes important for that particular person. Now, I'll give you an example that happened here today to me. I was talking today to someone in, during lunch, and she mentioned a power blackout in Amsterdam and how that had uh, messed up the data centers really quickly within a few hours. I ran to my slides and I said, I've forgotten to add data centers to this. I had everything else in there, but not the data centers. And so all of a sudden, because it was brought to my attention, it felt really important and I put it in the presentation. So whenever you draw people's attention to something, it becomes important merely because it is, it is in your attention. It also explains why, why committee meetings can lose 10, 15 minutes on useless conversation simply because someone brought up a con like an idea and everyone started talking about that idea whereas it was not important for the agen agenda of the meeting. So, but we can use that here in a positive way. We can, we can build the experience around those particular aspects that we want answers to and have them bring them to the attention of people so that they will start talking about it. The second one, the second principle that I thought we could use <coughs> is our propensity for social judgment. You only have to look at Twitter to see how good we are at judging other people, right? And it's not a social media thing, it's in the Bible as well. It's been going on for a long time. But it is really a core aspect of what we do as humans. We're constantly thinking about the intentions and motivations of other people. And so I thought, like, okay, let's try to use that here for us to allow us to see how people will, will think about those who um, had experienced a blackout. So we, we started from the premise that the blackout happened. It happened. It's something that happened in the past. And you're going to review the stories of people who have lived through this. And through those stories, we can recreate the conditions that people experienced the fact that their freezer stopped working and they had to throw away all the food, the fact that they gave half of the street food poisoning, the fact that someone uh, 
poison their kids with monoxide poisoning and all of that. We can build that into those stories and we can, we can give, we can use our social imagination to help us understand what it feels like to go through this. And then we build in that the, the, the narratives, the stories of individuals who need to be judged on their behavior. And the way we phrased it is that they're up for an award, Citizen of the Blackouts. And this is not um, so far-fetched if you know that in some parts of the country they have Parishioner of the Year contests. And so we really modeled ourselves on Parishioner of the Year. And in those local communities where they run these contests, it's a big thing. It's a very political thing. So we're, we're kind of like, we're, so we're building this as a, as a, you have to judge these people for how well they did or how poorly they did with all the choices and the decisions that they made. And then we weave the questions and the decision points that the cabinet office needs answers to in those narratives. So, um, just a quick recap of them here. Uh, travel, critical worker, essential resources, community behavior, illegal actions, resourcefulness, and then how does official communication affect those? So, uh, where are we with this project right now? We have done two paper prototypes, and um, that means that we don't have the we don't have the digital version, version at that moment. Those are really just paper and pen versions that allow you to make changes to all of the scripts, etc. before you start recording things with actors and start making the, the whole digital thing. And I will play you two very short examples of the group discussions that have happened in those paper prototypes when we were drawing people's attentions to illegal things that can happen as part of the blackout. And they're from two consecutive days, so they're two different groups. And they responded very differently to the situation that we had created for them. The, the conversation was slightly different, but very interesting in, in different ways. So this is the first group from the first day. Yeah, yeah. So so just, what if I was a teenager who was hiding all through the outside of the street? Then I think that's interesting. Yeah. Because yeah. on the street, yeah. there's someone else is there. Sorry, that wasn't very uh, easy to hear, but one of the reasons why I played it is because to show how lively and engaged the conversation was. Because it's important that, we, that you manage to recreate something that captures people's attention, and not just their attention, but really engages them. Um, and, and I don't know if you heard some of the really funny things that were being said in there. Like, they were talking about whether they would be the ones to break the glass, to, to go inside the, the supermarket and take the food out. And so one person said, well, I would break the glass, I'd be the one. And another said, no, I'm far too much of a pussy for that, I would never do that. But I'd be standing there if someone were to hand me things through the hole in the glass and I'd accept it and I'd run away with it. And then someone else said, well, I'd ask the kid to take a ball and kick it to the glass until it breaks, and then the glass is open and it doesn't need to be broken anymore. So the reason why these type of conversations hold useful information about how people will respond really in that situation is because they tell you something about how acceptable they find certain types of behaviors for themselves, <coughs> for others, and how they are justifying the behavior that they might be talking about. So in the second group, um, they weren't talking about whether they would steal. They were talking about the character and the story we had woven for them. 
And so they were talking about like whether that character had acted in a justified way or not. And this is a, a short snippet from that conversation. <laughs> So she starts talking about the rule of law, and now it's a discussion about is there anything else in the, than the rule of law to keep us safe here? And someone says, well, there's community. And then they say, well, clearly we don't have community because all of us would be filling up our bath. And so there's that type of conversation going on. And then some of them start justifying the behavior of stealing that they have been talking about. So now you get some insights in how they're justifying their own, potentially their own behavior, but also other people's behavior. Okay, so they're now creating the experience and we've got six trials coming up early December. Very quickly, what type of data can you get from this? this quantitative data that we're assembling with the digital platform, where people are voting, are putting in pieces of data, and that's quantitative stuff for us to review. Qualitative data from the group deliberations. We have to analyze that. It's a big question how. There will be debrief discussions after the experience, and we want to use also surveys and questionnaires. They're not out of the question to use, because they're really going to be useful to help us understand what that gap is between intentions and behaviors. If you just ask people, will they respond something differently than from when they are going through the experience? And that allows us to understand where we can we trust their intentions, their stated intentions, and where do we have to be skeptical about their state. Uh, looking ahead, um, we will have to learn to ask the right questions to get insightful answers here. It's not a given yet. This is a pilot project. We're learning an awful lot about how to do this. We'll have to learn to read the data. It's not like analyzing text data is not my, it's not my forte. I don't know much about it. Uh, but I also think we might need new methods for doing that, that we don't have at the moment. We'll have to trial this with different communities, potentially with scenarios that are local to those communities. The one we have now is sort of a small suburban um, town just outside Reading. Uh, but what do we need to change if we want to run this in a city or really in the, in the middle of nowhere? And how do we um, <coughs> insert the official government communication and the choices that government has to report, respond on this? So the government at this moment doesn't know whether they should tell people that it's going to last seven days and when they should be telling this. Should they, should, be, should they be saying this up front or somewhere in the middle or should they actually not say that at all? They don't really know at the moment. So it's a tool that can help, help, <coughs> sorry, help you understand that. Um, and that co-creation with the end users is really super important to keep on doing that. And then what is type of format can give us is, first of all, I mentioned already, it makes co-creation the norm. This is now a platform in which we can drop any type of decision um, question and allow people to experience that. Any challenging situation can be recreated in this. One other one that we're already working on is um, when in the NHS um, a mistake happens and someone dies uh, needlessly, they do a root cause analysis, and they have a panel of a root cause analysis. There is currently no training for people to prepare them for that situation when they have to go through that root cause analysis. So this is an experiential training tool that allows you to do that. The start panels that we were talking about this morning strike me as another possibility. If you need to train people to be prepared before they come into the panel to do this, it's a, a tool that can help you do that. Um, I'm not going to say much more as a research tool. There's a lot of psychological things that you can be testing with it. We started with doing the group consensus disagreement, but we're now coming up with lots of other different ways that we can do it. Um, and I'm very happy to talk in questions about how this relates to others, other sort of strategy games and scenario methods that exist. Some dates um, for if you want to take part in this in the future. Okay? Thank you.